Welcome to the Business Legends Podcast, where we interview business leaders and entrepreneurs so that you can learn from their success, become inspired, and meet the people that make change happen. I'm the host of the show, Reese Ron, and today I'm accompanied by the man, the myth, the legend, uh, William Sandy Solomon. And by the way, the only reason that I know that's your actual name is because it's your email. So <laughs> I, was, I was sitting there trying to dig through it, and I was like, I was like, where's Sandy's email? And I was like, who's this William character? So I, uh, I'm using your government name, so I hope that's okay. Um, <laughs> I do like to be called Sandy. Sandy, yep, yep, I see it, but I see, I see you got the W on the business card. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sandy here is uh, with Covenant Advisory Group, and uh, how long have you been doing that for, man? So I have been in the financial services business for, this fall will be 29 years. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That How did you get into it, 29 years? Uh, that's that's a big part of my story, not, okay. not the normal way. Okay. Not the normal way. I... Um, I, I, I came into the business mostly by default. Okay. And there's a story behind that. All right. So let's are, let's you let her want to jump into that. Yeah. Right away? Let's get into it. So, quick backstory is I I am not third major in college for <laughs> known what they wanted to do. Okay. And, and I, <laughs> I undeclared major in college for <laughs> yeah. eight years. Van Wilder's ass. I got you. I I admire people that like I had childhood friends that said, you know, when they were 10, they knew they wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Or when they were 13, you know, they knew they wanted to go into the army or right. whatever it was. And I, you know, when I was 13, I just wanted to listen to albums with headsets on and okay. lay on the floor. Okay, gotcha. Right? <laughs> you just wanted to be in the so, music. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I, I believe that, there, that luck plays an incredible role in most people's success story and certainly it does mine absolutely and so I would say I was very lucky twice okay I was very lucky in the late 70s to get into the apparel business okay which I did for about two decades wow and I sold blue jeans basically is what I did okay for about 20 years wow uh, to department stores and to specialty chain shops and that industry collapsed in the middle 90s okay and at that time, my most clever idea was to sell cars. That's that's how many, that that's what I could think of. Yeah. And I had. I'll teach you a lot about life. I, I used to sell cars. I, <laughs> I just remarried. Okay. And I was very nearly ready to turn forty. Okay. And I found myself looking for a job after a couple of decades selling apparel. Right. And if they hadn't turned me away at a local car dealership to sell cars, I probably wouldn't be in the financial services business today. I, I have an interesting question about that. And by the way, do you, do you consider that to be one of your lucky moments when they turned you away from the car dealership? Without, 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 yeah. <laughs> and nothing. And I'm a kind of a car guy. Yeah. And I'm still fascinated by the car business. Yeah. But I think that business. my my career in financial services has been perhaps a lot more satisfying than it would have been to to, to be in the car business. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, the uh, <laughs> the car the car business is a wacky one, my friend. It's it's something else. Um, here's an interesting question for you. Uh, why why do you think they didn't hire you at the car at the car dealership? Well, I remember what I would they, have hired you, <laughs> and I and I expected to be hired. Right, Reese, I did yeah. because I had a lot of sales experience, okay. and, I, and I I thought I presented myself professionally. And sure, I had every expectation that they would hire me. Okay, and so I was really surprised and disappointed when they didn't. And and, and I remember what the guy said to me. This is a high line dealership. Sure, and um, it's good. I'm sure a good place to work. He looked at me and he said, "You don't know how to sell cars. We don't need you." That's huh. what he said. You don't know how to sell cars. We don't need you, or we can't use you. I think were his exact words. Okay. And so the interview lasted about that long. Wow, no kidding. He didn't ask me any questions about my background, or he asked me if you ever sold cars before. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if, you know, because the the world is ever changing, especially the the climate of sales in general. And uh, this may be a, a bit of a, of a naive way of thinking, but it is truly the way I believe. I believe that if you if you approach any type of sales, and really we're all in sales constantly. I mean, um, I think of I think of sales like interpersonal relationships sometimes, making sure that people like you or know what you do at least, or or promoting yourself in a positive light type of thing. But I mean, I think that that sales techniques for the most part are ubiquitous. Like it doesn't matter if you're selling a widget, a car, or a pen. Like I think that. I think that if you understand that it comes from from a willingness to serve and, and to you know make a person's day better or, or crack a joke and make them smile type of thing, I mean, I think 
I think that's a winning thing. So uh, we're aligned on that. Yeah, you and I could probably talk the whole podcast on those principles. Yeah, for sure. We won't, but we, yeah. we could. We could. We could. Yeah. Um, you know, I I do want to I do want to dig into that a little bit though. Um, so so you basically the guy doesn't hire you. Okay. Now, how did you feel about that, that at the time? Did you feel devastated that day, or or disappointed, or because you expected to be hired? I was I was crushed. Okay. I was crushed. Gotcha. In fact, so. This will make a little more sense if I give you just a quick, if I could set the scene. Sure, quickly. yeah. I, I had just remarried. Right. I was about to turn 40. I was unemployed for the first time. And so this is in the middle 90s, 1995. This is before the internet. Mm -hmm. This is really before cell phones were ubiquitous. Um, I had never written a resume. Oh, yeah. Because I'd been in the apparel business since college. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have any computer skills. I didn't. Okay. I didn't know how to type or do anything like that. Okay. And and so um, I go in with this is the only idea I have. Mm -hmm. Reese is, is is I've been selling apparel. I did it pretty successfully at, at a pretty high level. I sure. had a remarkably good income for a long time. Yeah. And I never wanted to be out of the apparel business. That was not. That was not was uh, part. Yeah, I wasn't looking to get out of the apparel business. The apparel business came to a it, it went screeching halt. I mean, yeah. you look at you look at uh, Kannapolis, West. North Carolina. The the Cannon Mills there. I mean, it used to be the biggest employer. That's happened there, all over all, all the over States. the world. Yep. Mm -hmm. The apparel business has basically collapsed. It it it, it consolidated and realigned. And, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know what I was going to do, and I became so depressed after this incident that I actually went to see a psychiatrist. Wow. And this now, is after, I'm sorry, after the apparel or after the car dealership experience? Uh, it, was, it was in that period. Okay. It, it, I think the catalyst was being turned away at the car dealership. Okay. And, and was this the only place that you applied at, or did you, did it you was have the, some other? It was the only move I made to begin with. Okay, gotcha. It was the first move I made when I found out that my apparel manufacturing company was bankrupt. Okay. That I had worked for for 12 years yeah. previous. Um, and I was a, an integral part of that team. Yeah. It's really where I grew up in business was there. And uh, when it ended, it ended very abruptly, very <laughs> unceremoniously. Yeah, I, that's never I was, fun. It was the owner's son who broke the news to me, the business is in Chapter 11. And I, I learned the meaning of the term unsecured creditor of the corporation. Oof. What that means is that we're we're out of money and yeah. we can't pay you. Oof. Yikes. And so at the time, they, they owed me a considerable amount of money. Yeah. In, in today's dollars, it would have been... Probably a multiple six-figure sum. Oof! Yikes! In today's money. Yeah. So um, that was the state of mind that I was in, and I, I and so when I realized the car business was probably not an option, I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. And so I made an appointment to see a psychiatrist, and this is perhaps one of. They the, told you you should be fine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this, well, this is this is this is a pivotal moment for me in my okay. life, and it probably is a pivotal moment in my story. Is I went in, I met with the psychiatrist. He saw me for 50 minutes. I remember it was $175. Okay. 1995. Yeah. And he and I said to him, I'm depressed and I need medication. Wow. And I need therapy. Yeah. And he said, Well, tell me, tell me why. Right. So for about 50 minutes, I described my situation to him. And at the end of that appointment, he said this to me. He said, Sandy, he said, I'm not going to write you a prescription. Yeah. He said, Your depression is real, but it's situational. Yeah. And here's the problem. You're not flexible. Hmm. You're not flexible. And then he said this. He said, your problem, like many men that I see, is that you think there's one right answer and all the others are wrong. Yeah. That there's only one option that's really workable for you and the others are wrong. He said, that's just not how it is. Yeah. How it is is you need to make a decision. And then if it doesn't work out the way you'd hoped, then you'll be free to make another decision after that. Right. And that freed me up mentally to pursue a career in financial services. Because yeah. when I was first offered an interview where I work now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, twenty. And you've stayed in the same company? Yeah. And, okay, that's amazing. 20, 29 years later. Wow. Um, I, I was offered an opportunity to interview by a colleague and, and a friend. Uh, who had heard about my situation, and I remember going home and telling my new wife, we'd been married, this was probably July or August of 95. We'd been married since May of 95. Okay, so very recently. They want me to come in for an interview. And then I said, 
I'm not interested. Yeah. There's no way. I can't see myself doing that. Right. And then she said this. She said, what do you got to lose? Yeah. I, she helped me write a resume. I had never written a resume. And so I went in with this freedom to listen because yeah. the psychiatrist told me that it was okay to make a mistake. Yeah, and be flexible with it. Be flexible. I, you yeah. know, and I think, I think there's so many, so, so, so many people, and I truly believe, back to what your psychiatrist said in that, in that very first meeting, you know, he was talking about many men suffer from this, and I, I, I think men are just worse at this than women in general, which is that just the flexibility of, of you know, instead of, you know, having the plan and, and the perfect plan and proceeding with the perfect, you know, direction type of thing like like life ain't like that man like like you're gonna go this way and then you're gonna get pulled over here and then pulled over there and yanked over there and and you know there's multiple doors multiple paths always and it it's tough it's tough to be flexible enough to do that because yeah. you know you've been in financial financial industry now for 29 years 30 years ago you probably didn't think you were going to be and you certainly probably didn't think you're going to be 30 years from then you know i couldn't have even imagined it right so yeah. it is what it is. Um, I want to. I, I just happened to see this when uh, when we were taking our break before the show, and I, I want to read this for for our listeners. So um, on on your business card, you have your mission, and I like to talk to people about marketing things. Uh, it's a it's a little bit of a, a self interest, of course, but um, I really like this, and I've never seen anybody do this before. So I just wanted to bring this up on the air. Okay. Do you, Do you know your your mission verbatim, by the way? Uh, I, you know, I don't. Okay. <laughs> but, but I have it on the back of my card to remind. There, you. there you go. Yeah, you can read it. Aside. No, it's a long one. I don't. I don't think I can memorize this yeah. given infinite amount of time. But here we go. So it's Covenant Advisory Group. Our mission. The term covenant defines our purpose, the highest and best form of relationship. A relationship that's personal, where client interests come first. A relationship that allows us to serve in every way possible. In doing so, we aspire to help people live better and to make our world a better place to live. And that is a great mission. Um, you know, we were talking. Yeah, we were, we were talking about this before the before the show a little bit, and um, you are in a very complicated industry. You are not selling an ink pen. If you if you want to buy an ink pen, then you say, "Hey, I'm out of ink. I need a <laughs> pen. Give me that pen. That is good." You know, and then buy a pen, one dollar, two dollar, whatever. You know, yeah. done. Whatever. Um, you are in an industry where you're dealing with with what is arguably a person's most private matters. Their their uh, their finances and things like this, and so it's all relationship driven. And I I really think that it's powerful help help people live better and to make our world a better place to live. So so your mission expounds expands and expounds beyond uh, beyond just the interpersonal relationship you create with other people, but you enable them to you know affect those around them, and then you have that 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 network that, that kind of extends extends beyond that. So um, I just wanted to point that out, and, that, and that's I'm something. I'm happy that you did that. I, yeah. I, uh, Next I time, don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah, after you get to know me, you'll know I don't try to take credit for a lot yeah. uh, because I don't feel like I deserve to. Yeah. I did write that, mm -hmm. and that is. You, you wrote that, it. Awesome. That's I did, awesome. I didn't have any help from a marketing person. Yeah. I wrote that. No AI. <laughs> no AI. Yeah, that, I wrote That's that a awesome. long time before AI was anything anybody knew how to use. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and, and it, it still describes how I feel about the work that we do. Is is it can be life changing. Um, it's sad when we are in a position to help someone and they either refuse the help or they don't think it'll work. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably a failure of trust, like you were talking about. For sure. For sure. Um, on, on the subject of that, um, you know, you're also in a, in a highly competitive industry. And so, um, you know, do you, do you think that that affects the breach of trust? And what I mean by that specifically is that um, it seems like that the, there are more people in the financial space than there ever have been. Um, you, you know, you see folks at just about every networking event that you go to type of thing. Um, do, you, do you think that, you know, not necessarily those types, the new players in the industry are giving you a bad name necessarily, but... Uh, or your industry a bad name, but do you think that the competition is is what drives the lack of trust, or what do you think that comes from? So, I think that comes from human nature. Okay. But a lot of a lot of what you just said is probably the conventional wisdom, and I don't mean to contradict you, but it, it financial services is a very crowded field. There's no mm -hmm. question, but our population is actually diminishing. Okay. There are fewer people in financial services now than there were in recent years. Yeah. Why do you Part, think that is? Or do a, lot, or, a lot of it is because of of regulatory intervention. Yeah. Complexity. Um, computer technology has mm -hmm. done a lot. Um, 
just the 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 demographics of our society, people moving out of small towns and into big cities. Mm-hmm. So there used to be a financial advisor in every little town. Sure. And a That's lot of who times you to, they whatever, were your yeah. banker, your life insurance agent. There was someone that was interacting with the community mm-hmm. in small towns, and that almost doesn't exist at all anymore. All yeah. the, the industry's gravitated toward money centers and, and metropolitan areas a sure. lot. So if you live in a crowded metropolitan area, for instance, like Charlotte, mm-hmm. uh, and Charlotte is perhaps the most competitive market in America for this industry. Wow. I mean, because I believe the it. Because the big players are all here. Yeah. TIAA is here, Fidelity's here, Bank of America's Bank here, Art, Wells yeah. Fargo's here. Mm-hmm. I could I could make a longer list than that. Yeah. And but those are your big ones, Truist yeah. as well. True, you know, Truist yep. is and uh, here. Ally. I mean, yeah. they're all there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm sitting. Here, uh, I never even considered that before, but I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, oh my God, all, they, all they really the big, are all here. All the yeah. big broker dealers have a presence here. All the yeah. insurance companies have a presence here. So, it's it's a very crowded field, and it's a little bit like the realty field in okay. that there are a lot of well established teams and individuals that have a, a lot of collective what's the right way to say this market share yeah yeah and then there are a lot of new entrants into the industry and and, and in, entrances the bar to entry is fairly low okay but the bar to success is fairly high that makes sense okay because yeah. it's not an industry where many salaries exist it's yeah. almost all production based compensation yeah and so the industry statistics tell us that about 89% of the people that try the business wow. will leave in the first five years. Wow. So that says that 11% don't leave. Yeah. And of that How's group, it feel being the top 11%, man? <laughs> it's, it's great. I'm, I'm actually doing even better than that. Now. Yeah, I believe you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, I was but, gonna say twenty nine years. You're probably in like the top zero point oh, three or something. Like, I, yeah. Probably maybe the top two percent. Wow, that's perhaps. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Um, which is astonishing to yeah. me, and we'll talk. You know, we can talk a little bit about that. But what's interesting to look at is of that ten or eleven percent that do make it in the industry, an astonishing, astonishing percentage of those individuals make this a lifelong career. Yeah, and in some cases they stay well into their seventies. Yeah, into their eighties. For the audience, I just turned 68. Wow. And so you know, I'm, at, I'm, in, man. <laughs> I'm in full retirement age for yeah. a lot of industries or right. beyond it. Yeah. And I'm still going strong. I was going to say, I, you don't seem like you're slowing down at all. Yeah, I, have like, the, I have the practice I always wanted to have today. So heck yeah. That's there's awesome. There's not a lot of reason to quit. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy. Your, it's like, it's it's so funny. I think that I think that business people in general, you know, they when they when they start a business, they're on the grind. They're working 70, hour, 70 80 hours a week and things head like down. that. And yeah, head down, you know on the grindstone type of thing. And then, you know, business is cyclical. You know, I think that I think that you reach a certain level of success and sometimes sometimes you get comfortable there and then your business either continue like slowly grows or slowly declines or whatever. And then usually something happens if you have a drop off, then it kind of refocuses you. But the the road to success is hardly ever linear upward. You know, it's it's almost always it just in my experience, you know, it's like it's like up down a little bit it's like a roller coaster yeah. up, down up way down way up you know it's just the that's just the entrepreneurial yeah, journey the, the the bias is up but it's punctuated by plateaus that's and right turns and setbacks and you know in my since i've been in the industry i've been through the dot-com bubble burst wow the 911 disaster yeah uh 2008 yeah the 2008 the great financial crisis we now call it the gfc we, yeah we were much closer to the precipice than anybody really realized at the time yeah and then the covid pandemic which is a whole nother. so all of those things have happened since i've been in the industry yeah and and actually probably um it's been interesting to watch my my business has prospered during times of great difficulty sure rather than in times of great prosperity and it's because people get fearful yeah. and they start looking for help and advice when you know like a, a bear like market fear cycle yeah. is great for the financial industry right. interestingly enough it's terrible for our clients yeah but it's they depend on us to help them through it and that's when you know get that fear money moves around for sure people are afraid yeah my um it's it, it's interesting um i always think about things from a marketing perspective for obvious reasons but um you know there's there's 
everybody responds to different forms of marketing, right? And so like you have marketing techniques like the fear of missing out, you know, but don't don't miss out on this deal. We're only oh, doing it till July fourth. Yeah, we're only doing it till July fourth or something like yeah. that, you know. And then other people respond to uh, positive marketing, which is to say, do this and you'll feel great, look great, be great type of thing. You know, this is going to impact your life positively type of thing. And then one of the biggest pulls, which is what you just mentioned, is fear-based marketing, which is to say, you know, gloom and doom and apocalypse unless blank, you know? And so it's interesting because um, my podcast guest last week's name is Andy Dinkin, and his uh, his um, company is The Seals USA. And what they do... I know Andy pretty well. Oh, okay, so never mind. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I've, I've been to The Seals. I've seen their... Oh, that's awesome. Facility. Oh, Andy's sweet. Cool. Yeah. Oh, he's, God, yeah. he's amazing. I can't um, wait to call him actually and tell him that. Yeah, I was just he's on vacation. Call him next okay. week. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm so bad about that. This is so so off topic. But uh, like, if you're on vacation, I will call you. I guarantee That's it. I will always <laughs> I always interrupt people's vacations. I've done it, I've literally done it like four times in the last week. But anyways, um, so anyway, for our listeners, um, just to recap, Andy's the seals. They do a commercial refrigeration seals and things like this. And their tagline, their marketing message tagline headline is. Um, is uh, we will we will fix a failed uh, health inspection type of thing, and it's like that's that fear based mm-hmm. like you know save you from gloom and doom type of thing. And so Andy and I were talking about that, and he's like, that's been the most effective you know strategy for that type of thing. So similarly in the financial environment, you know, it seems like that those moments, those pivotal moments, when all of a sudden you know my four hundred one k is down thirty percent or whatever, like it's. It's, it's time to talk to Sandy with that stuff. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting question. There's no right or wrong answer to it. But given the things that you've seen, dot-com bubble, 2011, uh, uh, September 11th, excuse me, can't talk, uh, September 11th, 2008, um, and then COVID. And I'm missing something huge between 2008 and 2020. Um, something, there was, a, there was another humongous thing in the, in the financial industry in that period, wasn't there, in that 12-year period? Well, we had a banking crisis. That's it. Okay. And that's that's when, uh, like, Ford got pulled out, right? With uh, Or not, no, Ford was the one company that didn't get bailed out, right? Or was that 2008 that that, that, that all happened? No, that was, no, that you're, you're talking about the great financial crisis. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. The TARP, the TARP relief from the government. And, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So out of all those things, which, which one would you say affected your business the most or the least? Well, I, I think that it would probably be relatively equal between the great financial crisis and COVID. Sure. And I think that if COVID had happened a decade sooner, mm-hmm. if, if the order had been reversed, yeah, um, we would have been as an as an industry and perhaps even as a country in deep deep trouble. Oh yeah. And what saved us was video tech. Uh, video conferencing technology. Definitely. So we were able to continue meeting with clients. Yeah. Face to face, in spite of the fact that we weren't allowed to leave our homes yeah. for a long time yeah. or go to an office, and so that technology was accompanied by, you know, um, scanning and and um, email technology, um, electronic signature technology, DocuSign, mm-hmm. so we could actually meet with someone and have them sign a document without. Yeah, without having to getting together, shake hands. When like I started in the industry, the the first thing they teach you is don't speak until you're in the room, sure, with all the decision makers, and they're at the table with you, and you're three feet of, feet apart. Yeah, don't say a word until then. Yeah, that's. And now it's like, well, I I may you, I may go for a month without seeing anybody at all in person. Yeah, you know that's that's an interesting subject in itself, and the the uh, the societal climate is always changing anyways but the uh i i i have this i have this feeling okay and it's just it's just a feeling working with all sorts of different businesses and i'm I'm very interested to hear your opinion on this because things change and the way that sales cycles work has changed i mean i can remember back 10 15 years ago i'm getting into sales and you almost you almost do like a like takeaway sales and things like this you know and and you have you have these these premises that you know it's just a completely different sales it's way it's a way harder technique like oh no you don't need that we're gonna we're gonna do something different you know mm-hmm. um, but anyway the reason that I bring all this up is because um, these days do you feel do you feel like that's still the most effective way on average I know everybody's different but do you think it's still the most effective form to wait until the decision makers are there or do you think it's you know feed people information establish trust build relationship and then when they're ready, it's time to time to rock and roll. 
So or that's both. a that's a really great question, and I think the answer probably lies. It's probably a generational question, meaning okay. that millennials and Gen Zs yeah. might behave perhaps differently than sure. baby boomers or. So I'm a baby boomer. Yeah. Right? I, I was born in 56, and so I think 57 was the year that more people were born in America during this generation than yeah. any other year, so I'm right right in that yeah. in that group. You're the boom. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're in our 60s and early 70s. Yeah. Uh, and we relate very differently than, say, for instance, millennials. Sure. Which are typically our children. Yeah. Or uh, Gen Xers or Gen Zers. Yeah. So I never really thought about it that way. Yeah, that I think I think it depends on who you're speaking to more than anything else. Yeah. Some people require some people actually want to make the decision based exclusively on trust. Okay. And then some people want to make the decision based on information. Sure. And then they want to fact check and verify with trust. Yeah. So it really depends. Yeah. You know, Nobody's the same. No. And and consumers now, when they come to the table to buy anything, they are better equipped oftentimes than the people doing the selling. Wow. Like they, because, already, they already know. Because <laughs> they have data at their fingertips. Yeah. Yeah. That's That that can be intimidating too. Just it because, can be, yeah. you know, if, if you're offering whatever, you know, somebody might be like, oh, I have a better rate here or whatever. You're like, whoa. <laughs> I, I remember there was a day when you couldn't, your, dam- your reputation couldn't be damaged except you know, one conversation at a time. Right. Now it's... T- today, if, if you make a misstep, everybody on earth knows about it. Yeah. That's that's a scary thing, too, right. you know, because it's like, I mean, and the uh, the thing about our society these days that really scares me from a from a, a populist standpoint, I should say, is that, to your point, like, if you make one misstep, then, you know, you can, it can blunder your reputation forever type of thing. Mm-hmm. And yet, at the same time, instinctively and intuitively, it's not a nice thing, but you are never going to get along with everybody, period. Nobody's right. ever going to get along with everybody. You can always try, but at the end of the day, there are people that exist that have different personalities, and and you're not meant to get along with every single person, you know? And if you make somebody mad enough that has, a, say, a personality opposite of yours or something like this, it can, it can irreparably damage your reputation, which, I mean, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. Well, now we have AI. We, we have profiling mechanisms where we can learn about people's personalities and yeah. AI can assemble a data sheet for us and I can wow. and I can look you up and I can see whether you're, you know, an influencer or a cautious compliant. You yeah. know, I, I have a lot of data now that can tell me how I should behave in your presence. Wow, interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, even though I may know all of that, I, I think we make decisions about who to trust far more intuitively than that. I agree with you. I, I think we look in people's eyes mm-hmm. and we see into their hearts and we we can detect whether there's any, any sincerity there or mm-hmm. whose interests they have first in mind. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's only fair to say that most people have their own interests in mind most of the time. Most so of the time, sure. I think you need to know that. Yeah. And yeah. So what's their what's the benefit for me, you know, especially right. especially in finance. I mean, right. you know, um, there's a huge difference between somebody that wants to make a financial impact on the on society yeah. versus versus grow their own accounts and yeah. that type of thing. I, I will say this, Reese, that the sales tactics mm-hmm. have changed a lot, and I've been sure. in business for like four decades. Yeah, and sales tactics have changed a lot during that period. And I remember there was a time when your methods and your techniques were all designed to get people. To say yes. Okay. Like okay. building yes ladders and that type of thing, Brian Tracy. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. And today, I think it's exactly the opposite. I think the right tactics are the tactics that give your prospective client permission to share the truth with you, even if it's something you don't want to hear as yeah. a seller. Okay. And, and I believe that that's how you build relationships of trust is you give people authentic permission to tell you what they really want and what they really need. And then, of course, you always have an opportunity for a rebuttal if you're good. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of times when I'm dealing with clients and they don't know what they don't know. Sure. And that's where my job security should lie, right, is, yeah. is in the fact that people don't have and you can expert advise the on, experience on yeah. that, I, that I have. Yeah. But I, I, think it, I think today the selling business is really more about granting people the ability to, to tell you the truth. That's really well said, Sandy. Um, I'm sitting here thinking about um, just consultations and things like that that I've had, 
And um, I, I mean, to tell you the truth, I, I very recently had a had an onboarding call, and a person uh, came to me for a service or whatever. And and the first thing I asked is like, okay, what's your goal out of that? Like, why do you want that service? You know? And they said, well, I want to do this. And I said, well, uh, <laughs> this is what I said. You know me. I mean, I'm not I'm not bashful, but I was like I was like, all right, here's the deal. You can pay me uh, double, and I'll do that. And you're not going to get as good of a result as if we do this, basically, right? And they're like. Well, I want to do that. I was like, yeah, I thought you would. <laughs> so, and sure enough, I mean, but it's just your experience yields into that. But it's interesting because I'm, I was immediately able to gain their trust by saying like, hey, like I'm not out, I'm not out to screw you, man. Like, I, like I'm, I'm here to help you achieve your goals of what, of what your end goal result is. And who knows, maybe later, maybe later they'll do both, you know, or whatever. That's the most ideal situation. But um, it's, the, the sales cycles are very interesting. And um, here's an interesting question for you. I know every industry is different, but um, do you think that sales cycles uh, change based on election years? I know that's just a wild question, but so like 2016, 2020, 2024. You know, I, I know I've, I've, I've seen some data on markets mm -hmm. and I don't think they necessarily coincide with sales cycles, but mm -hmm. elections don't have nearly as much influence over markets as most people think. Mm -hmm. Most people think that the government and the economy and the markets are all the same thing, but they're actually sure. not. Uh, they are certainly correlated, and there, there, there are important connections between those, but um, I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. I, th I think perhaps uncertainty... Uh, or ambiguity causes people to second guess sure. big purchasing decisions. And so sure. if I felt like things might change in the tax code, I right. might not buy a second home right. before I find out who's going to be president for the next four years. Yeah. As an example. Yeah. So maybe maybe the elections do have Yeah. It's it's interesting. I was just talking to my business partner about this and uh, right before walking up and saying hello to you, but we were talking about um, just, just the differences over, over the years. You know, we've been doing this for eight years now. And so um, it just seems to us like um, that the, the sales cycle has slowed down and perhaps me, people are more hesitant with, the, with their investment. And we can't really attribute what that is. But I tell people that it's like, you know, generally speaking, if, if my typical sales consult is, you know, two meetings or something like that, and then we onboard because number one is getting to know you, number two is this is the plan, number three is execute the plan, right? You know, nowadays it might take three, four, five meetings type of thing to like let's really get granular and, and hash this stuff out and figure out like what makes the most sense and why it makes the most sense, what's your reasoning for it and things like this. And um, it's interesting because I think that the introductory for us, at least this year, and I don't, I don't exactly know why, and it's just the market that we get, right? But that part of the process has slowed down uh -huh. but the the but when you have these multiple touch points with clients you develop this familiarity and all of a sudden I know your birthday and your wife's name and your dog's name and stuff like that and so we're able to uh, kind of expand the relationship and it makes the contracts like better so it's like just because the sales process takes longer the contract works better because we have this level of familiarity and that goes right back to your mission statement by the way I went full circle on you here but yeah. you know developing developing the relationships is crazy critical in any type of service industry. Totally agree. I think that, that the sales cycle needs to allow ample opportunity for the right disclosure. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's one of the things that we're trained to do in the financial sure. services business because we sell by prospectus and, and, and disclosures are mandated. Yeah. And if they're skipped over, they can cause problems later on. For sure. Uh, so these complicated products, they have features and benefits that most people aren't going to they're not going to understand them at a glance. They're going to they're going to have to be educated, and and so I agree with you. Is to to have a quality relationship with a client, you need to offer them disclosures that may not support your case for doing business with them. Sure. You you need to de declare represent what, honestly. What, what could go wrong? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, a yeah. it, it's that's very true. counterintuitive. That, length, that lengthens the cycle. Yeah, yeah. We for ethical um, people. Absolutely, and, yeah. and and as it should, as it should, and I think that it, it allows people to establish a lot more trust with you and things like this. And um, you know, it, it's it's interesting. And of course, I'm always every industry is different. And I'm always thinking about marketing, sales, and things like this. But um, it just seems like as as you elongate the the sales cycle and things, 
Um, I'll tell you something else that has changed within our industry is that is that I will give you every piece of information that <laughs> I know. I will I will tell you right. I will tell you this is what I'm going to use. This is how I'm going to use it. This is what I'm going to do. This is the platform that I use. This is the software. That's how much the software costs. Yeah. It, it's it's not full transparency. Complete, complete. You know, and as a consequence of that, you know, I've literally told you how to how to own a digital marketing agency. You know, <laughs> but right. but then people are like, I don't want to do that. And I was like, Oh, good. Pay me money, and then I'll do it. You know, and that's and that's 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 how our sales cycle has changed a little bit. You know, there was always like a like an intuitive like hesitancy to tell you tell oh I don't want to give you the secret sauce or whatever I'll give you all the sauce I don't care yeah. like like I'll tell you exactly what we're gonna do open and, source and and I mean because it's nothing you can't find out anyways okay. so it's yeah. uh it's that interesting might be how you change. make yourself indispensable to your client is be be a total open source to them and, yeah yeah and and <laughs> eventually they'll find a reason to buy something yeah and that's and that's it's so counterintuitive you know. Um, I have a colleague that he's in the same space that, that I work within, and uh, I've known him for years. And it's funny because, truthfully, him and I both, when we first started doing the marketing thing, we both were quite hesitant to say, oh, I don't think I want to tell people, like, you know, because what we're doing is not, we're not doing anything like rocket right. science, you know. It's something yep. that, you know, if you if you knew the platforms and systems that we use, we could train just about anybody to do it. It's one of the beautiful things about it, right? You have to understand marketing. You have to understand, you know, branding and essences, and, and you have to understand, um, you know, the way that things flow together. I guess that may, I guess that's the way to say. But um, nowadays, we both are just like, no, we're going to use this platform, and that's the software. <laughs> it's just, we just we just let it rip, man. So it's it's interesting how that how that stuff works. Um, let's go back in time. Let's go back thirty years. You, you so you start working in the financial. Uh, service industry. Your wife says um, says what you got to lose. Mm-hmm. Take the interview. You start. Um, so you know what was that? What was that first week like? Did you know what to expect or or because you? I don't think you you said I'm going to spend thirty years doing this. Like <laughs> what was the first week like? That is that is such a that is that is such a great question. Um, permit me to do one thing before right. I answer. Okay. I need to tell you what happened on my first interview. Oh Lord! Okay, wait, wait, not the car industry. The no, yeah, this okay. is this financial. Is I'm, I'm I'm now, I'm now at my first interview for the financial services okay. business, and and I have my resume in my bag, and I have no typing skills, okay, no computer experience, no knowledge of the industry. I didn't know the difference between a stock and a bond. I had I did not have an economics background. Or a finance background. I studied art. So you're not. I studied I, art in college. So you're not an ideal candidate. I basically. am the <laughs> least likely candidate in my I own mind. Yeah. I am bewildered by their interest in me. Okay. I had no, no way of understanding their interest in me. Okay. I I was upright. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no I, idea. And I I cleaned up. Yeah. Pretty well. So here's so I'm going to ask you the same yeah. the same question. Why do you think they hired you? So let me let me finish the yeah, yeah, story yeah, yeah. here because I think this will give you the insight All that right. you need. Is um, they probably couldn't have hired me if they'd done this any other way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the person that was interviewing me, <laughs> the person that was interviewing me, asked me this. They, they, of course, they said, "Welcome, Sandy. We're very happy you're here. You come. I was, I was recommended. Yeah. So you come highly recommended. You've been referred to us. I think that's what they said. You've been referred to us, which." Um, Makes you feel good. Makes you feel important. Yeah. And then they said this. They said, so let's have some fun. Let's take the first few minutes and let's talk about your ideal career situation. What would be the perfect next career opportunity for you? And, of course, I went into how I was accustomed to making a high six-figure income and that I needed to have complete autonomy to come and go as I pleased that I, yeah, I had all these requirements. Sure. And here I am. I have no knowledge of the industry. Yeah. I have all these requirements. And then I said, and you know, it would really be nice if I could do something that was, that was somehow socially meaningful. Now, remember, I've been in the garment business. Yeah. Haven't done anything socially meaningful for nearly two decades. I sold somebody a pair of jeans. Yeah. Uh, so here I am, you know, pontificating on what I'd like my next career to, 
And, and, and I remember her name was Mary. She sat back in her chair and she looked at me with sincerity and she was the perfect person to do this. I think she was about 70 years old at the time. Oh Lord. And she said, you know, Sandy, she said, based on your um, requirements, uh, we, we couldn't rule you out. She did not say this is the right career for you. She yeah. didn't extol the virtues of the industry. She didn't say you'll be successful or make money or, or you'll be happily ever after. She said we couldn't rule you out. And yeah. that, that was, you know, today I know what that was. That, yeah. That's called a negative reverse. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> it's, so um, it's, a, it's yep. a sales tactic. Yep. I didn't see it at the time. Yep. It's, a, it's a great sales tactic. Yep. It's a strip line. Let let the let the fish run. Yep. Before you set the hook, and and I did, and I ran, and I became in, and 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 she turned the table on me. I became interested in what she had to say. <laughs> she got like sucked you in. Yeah. <laughs> she, she owned me after. Yeah. That she. Yep, yep, she. She did. And I and I, you know, to this day, I'm grateful that she understood how to speak to me. Yeah. Because what's happened since then, it's it's. It's 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 undeniable that this was the right thing to have happen. Right. Um, but I was perilously close to walking away. Yeah. Because um, it seemed I like you were overly interested in the yeah, opportunity I, to begin with. Uh, what is it? Uh, contempt prior to investigation. Yeah. Is the phrase. It's yep. like I approaching with a negative attitude. So uh, yeah. So I, I I asked her because now I'm interested. So I yeah. said, well, well Mary. Help can, me because I on? don't see what you see in me. <laughs> she got you. She did. She owned me at that point. So here was her I love answer. It. I love it. She said, Sandy, she said, you have to understand that it will be easy for easier for us to teach you the yep. business yep. than for us to teach someone who understands the business people skills. Yeah. She said, the only reason I'm interested in you is you have two decades of people skills people experience. Skills. Yeah. And you seem like a pleasant person. You seem smart enough. Um, you have all the raw material, but you lack experience. Yeah. We, we, we have a training program for that. Yeah. And if you will come and do exactly what we say, chances are you'll do, you'll do very well. Yeah. Now, if you you'll don't do what we are. say, <laughs> right, if you don't do what we say, then all bets are off. Right. And so I had to make a decision if I would, as a almost 40 year old surrender to basically going training to school. Program. Yeah. And, and there were a lot of, you know, fresh college graduates and people like that. Sure. In the training program. But, but yeah, here so, we are, here we are. Here so we are. my, my first week, what happened was I didn't discover my affinity for doing this work until a little bit later. But what I did discover was a fascination about so I, I began to realize this is a really interesting business. Yeah, it is. It's a lot more interesting than the garment business. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah. And I, I, I now I understand the garment business was glamorous. Yeah. And the financial services business is not. Yeah. But the financial services business is a good business where the garment industry is not. The yeah. garment industry is well, not a good business. Yeah. And so Especially I began to see that the industry is founded in ethics and that People insist on doing the right thing. We actually have laws and rules that make us comply, fiduciary standards of care yeah. that make us comply with ethical everything, ethical standards. And I came from a business where that was not at all important. In yeah. fact, in fact, in the end, people were telling me to do things that I didn't feel were ethically right. Wow. And I went into a business where they were people were telling me you can't do unethical things. Yeah. We you won't be permitted to. You'll be sanctioned. You'll be barred. Yeah. We won't let you play, if you, if you don't Take acknowledge the yeah. rules. So I, I you know I very quickly, uh, I went home that night after my first kind of general meeting and told my wife, her name is Lou. I said, Lou, I said, I have no idea what they said in there today, but it was it was really interesting. <laughs> you would, that's a true story. You would yeah. you would love my business partner. So uh, very fast story and then we got we gotta go to lunch. But All right. uh, so my business partner, when we, we tell the story often, but when we when we started the business, I mean we're basically out of a garage, you know, type of thing, out of out of my office. And so you know, we're taking just about any type of marketing contract we can land, you know? And um, on, so I was always doing the campaigning, you know? Uh -huh. 
And then he was always doing the business development and the sales and things like this, you know? And he would always, you know, he'd always knock on my door. He'd kind of give me that, hey, buddy. And I'd always look over and be like, here it comes. No, <laughs> whatever you're about to say. And it's interesting because we, we push each other a lot. But, you know, he always pushed me to, to learn and do things that I was uncomfortable with. And and it's, it's, it's amazing because it's almost like trial by fire. And you end up learning a lot about a lot that you – wouldn't if you wouldn't get out of your comfort zone so yeah it's it's become a foundational belief of mine that uh, success is not the opposite of failure it's the result of it yeah and so I agree. it was a, a series of a lot of little failures you know learning how to type yeah um passing all these significant licensing examinations mm-hmm. the series mm-hmm. seven six mm-hmm. hour test mm-hmm. um, and many 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 more after that but it's 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 just the the it's forging ahead and correcting your errors and 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 staying with it that is what produces success and it's oftentimes and I've, I talked a little bit about the good fortune of being in the right place at the right time and not saying no right you know I wandered through the door of opportunity even though yeah. I was afraid yeah and you came well recommended <laughs> I, I came, I came well. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way it works. So yeah, I think success is the byproduct of a lot of failure, mostly. So. I I agree completely. Yeah. Um, there's a I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this quote and I'll get it right off air. I'm sure, but it's like um, it's like success success comes from ex- I got it. Success comes from comes from experience, and and experience uh, comes from failure. Experience comes from failure. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So. It's like that's right. Yeah, and I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so, okay, I got one question left for you. I like All to right. sign off with a fun question before we go off to lunch. I'm getting hungry. My stomach's grumbling, yeah, so yeah. we got to roll. But we're gonna need to do uh, this again. Yeah. We only, we only Heck got yeah. about halfway finished. Heck yeah, <laughs> we'll do it again. We'll do it again. I'll, I'll book yeah. you. Um, so, uh, let's say you're interviewing somebody to be to be one of one of your um, financial um, <laughs> financial professionals. Gonna, financial minions. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say minions, but I, yeah. I didn't want to. And then yeah. you did. They're so. going to be. They're going to yeah. be on the awesome. rather than the business legends podcast. They're yeah. going to be on the business minions. The podcast. The business minions. That's right. Yeah, that's we right. could that's, start a new show. Those a-holes. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I was thinking. Anyway, whatever. So you're, you're hiring a business minion. Yes. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> What what's your what's your favorite interview question now? Because you've been through these series of interviews, mm-hmm. and you know you had Mary who who did the negative drawback on you, and then you had you had the car industry who was like we don't need you, and then you know garments. So you've been through these types of things. So what what would your favorite interview question be? So that is a that is that's a great setup because uh, something that perhaps you don't know is eleven years of my career I spent as a hiring manager in okay. a firm. Okay. Okay. So you've asked this question more than once. I, I have <laughs> asked this. I have asked this question in high stakes interviews with okay. a lot of different kinds of candidates. Awesome. And my favorite question to ask is, what do you think the most difficult thing we will ask you to do will be? Interesting. What do you think will be the most difficult thing we ask you to do? And it turns out that that most difficult thing is to approach the people that you already know and tell them about your new career opportunity. Yeah. Is it's it's essential in my opinion to be willing to tell your friends what you're doing. Yeah. So that you remove influence. yourself from speaking just to strangers for some period of time in the beginning. Yep. And because that creates a lot of rejection and most yeah. people don't suffer rejection very well. I yeah. don't. Yeah. I'm sensitive. And and so we want to put you in a position where you're getting some wins early. Yeah. And usually those wins come from people that are already familiar with you and they know that you you can be trusted. Yeah. And, and the trust barrier yeah, is already gone. So yeah, yeah. That, that would be my favorite. That's question. a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. All right, my man. You are a business legend. Uh, let's do it again soon, and uh, let's go. This has been lunch. fun. Yeah, Thank absolutely, you. man. Yeah, we'll see you soon.